Hello, everyone, and welcome to Facebook Live with the Horticulturists. We are the Horticulturists, here to answer your gardening questions and share what we're up to in our gardens. My name is Candace Hart. I'm the State Master Gardener Specialist uh, for Illinois Extension, and I'm based here in Central Hello, Illinois. Everyone, and, uh, and I have two of my great horticulture colleagues with me today, and I'd love for them to introduce Hello, themselves everyone, as well. And welcome to Facebook Live with the Horticulturists. Uh, yeah, thanks, Candace. I'm Ryan Pankow, horticulture educator out of Champaign. Um, and, you know, my specialties are woody plants and vegetable gardening. Those are some of my favorites. Also like native plants. And uh, so those are kind of my areas of interest, but excited to be with you all today. And I'll hand it over to Kelly then for an intro. Um, hi, my name is Kelly Alsip, and I am a horticulture educator based out of Bloomington. Uh, my specialty is integrated pest management. Um, love those beneficial insects, love the pollinators. And then I um, grow my own vegetables uh, in my backyard. And so um, I just, I, I have a uh, 15 month old son, his name is Asher. And then I'm blessed enough to have a seven year old niece named Mirabelle and I just wanted to show you a couple of images of me gardening with them and me teaching them. And then uh, the episode today uh, is all about how to really engage your kids in, into these gardening. So I'm going to go ahead and show you a few pictures. Um... Awesome. And while Kelly's sharing her screen, feel free to start adding any uh, questions or comments into the comment box. We're here to answer your questions and chat about kids gardening stuff, like Kelly said. So feel free to get those going. Well, okay. I also add that it doesn't have to be about kids gardening specific. specific. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're happy to answer any other questions too. There we go. Okay. So can you see adorable little Mirabelle? <laughs> sure can. We taught her how to spritz the plants and she loved doing that. She also loved doing watering. This was when she was, um, you know, a still, you know, a young, a little kid. Uh, I love taking her places. This is us visiting the um, Japanese, uh, the Japanese garden at the <laughs> University of Illinois. She just loved exploring and getting into stuff. Um, this is um, us teaching her how to plant potatoes in a raised bed. She absolutely loved this. She loves planting seed too. She seeds a little heavy, so you got to thin a little bit, but you know, hey, to get them involved. Um, this is, I, I probably need to teach her how to use a magnifying glass, but this is her checking out a kale leaf. Here's her with some hydrangeas. Um, she really enjoyed these hydrangea blooms and played with them for a while. Here's Asher, and this is in my backyard. And he has discovered, he has gone through the discovery process of if marigolds are edible. And so he, he saw them, he picked them, and he ate them. He didn't like the taste. <laughs> Here's him checking out my grasshoppers. Um, he really is fascinated by my insects. Um, so uh, that was kind of cool, showing them insects. And then here's him helping me plant my eye pollinate garden. So he only tore a few plants and jostled some soil around. Other than that, he was really helpful and it was fun to garden with him. It took me maybe a little bit longer than I normally would, but I got to engage him the whole time. And then, um, this is what I wanted to share with you. This is actually, um, the, the picture was from the fall with Mirabel, and we kind of did this kind of nature looking collage. But um, take your kids out in the backyard and do um, your own collage like this. Um, you know, uh, we have a document called uh, Discovering the Wild in Your Own Backyard. 
where you can have kids go through and do a little scavenger hunt and look for these little things. And maybe they can make their own image or they can take images of it or they can draw. But, you know, one of the things that I really love about these types of uh, educational materials is you don't just walk through the garden and look, you actually investigate the garden. And so I think this is a really great way to get your kids involved is to get them to really investigate the backyard. Yeah, that's a really fun activity. And I, I mean, I think it, uh, it uh, appeals to kids in a wide range of ages because, you know, some of the things on there are just like uh, something in bloom, you know, and so when I like how it's kind of some of those uh, topics are left kind of open so that kid can get as into that or as not into that as they want to, you know, um, an older, an older kid may, may actually want to find a couple things in bloom, you know, or compare them. Whereas, yeah. You know, my, sensory type of scavenger hunts too, where something that smells good or something that's soft or something that's rough, just a way to get them mm -hmm. you know, out in the backyard because Sometimes I think when you go, hey, kids, go play in the backyard, they're like, what, what do I do? <laughs> Start. <laughs> and, uh, you know, when we were kids, we played in the backyard, right? I don't know if uh, they might need a little help. Good activity. And I want to awesome give a shout out. Oh, sorry. I would give a shout out too to our, our master gardeners. One of our master gardener interns actually created that little scavenger hunt so they've been doing some awesome projects to stay engaged too so we appreciate that yes thank you we use it all the time here in bloomington awesome okay well we asked you if you're just joining us we're kind of talking about kids gardening activities today talking about a couple different ideas things you can do out in the garden with kids where we'll take questions related to that and questions on anything gardening related too so feel free to add those questions into the comment box there and we're going to address them and before we kind of go back to more kids activities we did get one question that came up ahead of time so i say let's go ahead and answer that one. So we got a question about forsythia. So question is, what do you recommend as a replacement for a forsythia? Ours is over 30 years old and it hasn't come out very much yet at all. So it sounds like it's pretty old, maybe not flowering very much anymore. So replacement for forsythia, what would you guys do? So I guess when I think about a replacement, I, I just think of a shrub with a nice spring flower display. Isn't that kind of what you guys would think? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I would say keep it a similar season. Yeah. Yeah, so there's, when you start thinking about that, uh, spring flowering shrubs, um, there's, I like a lot of the um, variety in the viburnums, you know, so mm -hmm. every a Korean spice viburnum, I have one of those in my backyard that's in bloom right now and is super fragrant. Um, obviously not native, uh, but there's a whole list of native uh, viburnums that are available that, that bloom this time of year and um, can also fill that spot. You know, black haws, one that I've planted before and used that takes a little bit of shade. So if you had a shady spot, that would work well. So those are some of my, that's one of my kind of favorite set of, of species, um, you know, are, are just the viburnum, viburnum species. So that's their genus name. Um, would you guys have any other any other shrubs mm -hmm. you got like, that are kind of fit? I don't know if we're gonna have like the right replacement for for mm -hmm. Cynthia because I don't know if there's anything else that is as bright and yellow and vibrant as that. Mm -hmm. um, but I too concur with the viburnum, the Korean spice viburnum. It's extremely beautiful right now, not quite as showy, um, but. Uh, one of my favorite flowering shrubs is Father Gilia. Again, not quite as showy, but multiple seasons of interest. Um, it also will take a little bit of shade, um, but hands down my favorite shrub. I love hydrangeas too. They'll take a little bit of shade, but again, they're not flowering right now. They're gonna flower in the summer. You know what? Not, not quite a showy of a display is uh, one with spice bush. That's one of our natives. It's not going to take full sun very well. Uh, and it's also, there's male and female plants. So there's a few little stipulations there, but uh, it has tiny uh, yellow flowers very early in the season. 
So that's another thing, I guess, some of that we're mentioning maybe don't flower as early as for mm -hmm. Yeah, I was about for Scythia. Yeah, I was gonna say viburnums for sure too, hydrangeas for sure, even though not flowering right now, but later in the year. Um, my flowering quince is also just mm -hmm. about ready to pop open too, which might be a good, not yellow, but kind of still a bright flower that might also be a good good option too, so. Boy, and I've, I've been impressed with um, the amount of pollinating insects on quince. I mean, it is a super a magnet for that this time of year yeah. when it starts to open up. So not a native, yeah, so. it still provides that, you know, pollen and nectar for um, insects early in the season. Lots of Actually options. I've seen Cornelian cherry dogwood blooming in mm. the neighborhood too. It has really pretty yellow blooms um, if you have the space. So yeah. it's going to be a large shrub to small tree. Um, that could also be an option. And it, it just really pretty plant. Well, even the magnolias too, like star magnolias and, mm -hmm. and those would be, mm -hmm. if you, again, if you have the space. Yeah. Well, you know, I just, just last, uh, last year I planted a saucer magnolia that has a very columnar habit. Mm. I think it was Sunspire or I can't remember the exact variety name, something along those lines, Sunspire, Street Spire, something like that. But, um, you know, the plant doesn't get any more than six, six feet wide or something and just gets tall. So I really like that for a compact spot. It doesn't make your um, garden into a shade garden necessarily, but it, yeah, it, it has that compact canopy that you can still grow other things under. So that's always an option is looking for some of those weird cultivars or different forms of, of a plant you like. Mm -hmm. Good point. To, to fit the space. Awesome. I think we got some good suggestions there and we've had some comments and questions coming in. So let's see, uh, Amy commented back uh, here, Kelly, she said, clever way, clever use of pots for your eye pollinate garden. Uh, she did hers in the ground, so I think that's great. That's how I'm gonna try mine this summer as well. Uh, question from Joey, I'd like to add a solar powered fountain for birds into our school garden. So it sounds like they have a school garden, they wanna add a solar powered fountain. Any tips or tricks? bird fountains. This is not even close to my expertise. I'm sorry, I can't help. <laughs> I think fountains are a lot of work at a school garden. Um, somebody's got to be really on top of them. That's all I have to add. Yeah, I honestly don't have a lot of uh, water fountain expertise though too. Although I think solar power would probably be a good way to go. Uh, Cause it seems like the key with a bird bath or fountain is that you want moving water in there so that you're not having to clean it every couple days and the algae starts to grow. So yeah, I think that's a, probably a good way to go if you're gonna try it. Yeah, Feels I've like been impressed with- like that's a Roth question, sorry. Mm -hmm, for <laughs> sure. Uh, I was just gonna say, I've been impressed with, um, you know, just like I have solar lights around my garden and around my property. so. You know, a lot of my gardening or some, a lot of my activities happen at night after my kids are asleep. So I'm walking around in the dark a lot and just to keep, just to keep a little bit of light somewhere so you can kind of see where you're going. But I've been really impressed with how well those have held up. I mean, I think I have uh, some of those little solar lights that are maybe not 10 years old, but they're getting close and are still working. So whereas I think maybe 10 years ago, some of those solar powered products you could purchase fairly cheap just didn't last and you know after a season or two wouldn't last so I think there's been some improvements in just those products in general and I think you probably could with, with shopping around a little bit and, and maybe looking at some reviews and other things find one of those um, fountain type mechanisms that's you know mm -hmm. pretty well but I yeah I don't have he a lot of experience with an actual fountain yeah he said he's wondering about a bird bath with a bubbler so it sounds like a fairly simple mm -hmm. bubbler so yeah, it wouldn't take much energy to power. Yeah, so, yeah, I think it's worth trying. Yeah. Because like I said, you want to keep water moving in there so that you're not having as much algae growth. So that would be good. Great question, Joey. Um, okay, here's a good insect question for you, Kelly. Uh, Deborah asks, can you suggest mosquito repellent plants? We know we're going to have those starting. How about mosquito repellent plants? <laughs> 
um, even though they always tell mosquito <laughs> repellent plants they don't really work unless you're, you know, constantly like, you know, for instance, the scented geraniums. Um, if you were to, you know, pull a leaf off and break it constantly and rub it on your skin and it, it might uh, repel insects, but um, it, it's not, you're not just going to grow a plant and repel um, mosquitoes, but rather, uh, you know, mosquito populations, if you know, if you're not making sure there's no standing water around, cleaning your gutters, even your neighbors, if you, if your na your neighbors can also do it because the mosquitoes, they don't really fly too far. So they're breeding somewhere in the area. And that would be what I would work on is preventing the, the larva and uh, the breeding pla places that mosquitoes breed. Um, but, uh, yeah, I know, uh, Phil Nixon, uh, uh, retired entomologist, um, he, um, you know, of course, DEET is very well at preventing some of those mosquitoes, but also, um, he showed us an article that lemon eucalyptus, um, is an organic option that you can spray. Now, it doesn't last as long as DEET, so you're going to have to reapply it, but, it showed just as much effectiveness in um, preventing mosquito bites. So um, yeah, the plants are not gonna work, even though that would be a fabulous idea because I would, I so would do it because I get bit by a mosquito, I'm inside. <laughs> I'm no longer outside. Um, but yeah, really, really work on finding those places where mosquitoes breed and that is what's gonna help you out. You know, Kelly, one thing I've heard you mention before that I think is another great recommendation is just if you have that spot that you're planning on sitting outside, adding a fan or some air movement, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that really does change um, mosquitoes buzzing around you. So that's one. They won't fly. They're weak flyers, so they won't fly if you have a fan. That's a good tip. Mm -hmm. Nice. Okay, we've got a couple of questions over here on YouTube. So let's do those quick and then we'll touch on maybe some more of our kids gardening tips. So a uh, question here, can woody plants like sage be cloned? So propagation of woody plants like sage. What do you think? Yeah, well, well, gross. Yeah, I've got some sage that's just starting to come out of dormancy out in my garden and now would actually be a really good time to take some cuttings of that softer, newer growth and and clone them that way. That's what I would do versus trying to go farther down into that more woody tissue. Could you divide it, Candace? Yeah, you know, you probably could. It's got some smaller plants kind of coming off to the side, so I probably could do that as well. Yeah, absolutely. And that now would be a great time to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, I would say your answer is definitely, uh, but try to do those cuttings of younger growth if you can versus the woody growth. You can also get a rooting hormone too, if you feel like you need a little extra, extra hormone help there. Good. Yeah, I pretty much, I, I always use the rooting hormone just because I bought it in the past for things. And I just feel like it's a little bit of extra insurance, you know, to be sure you get some roots on yeah. that. It hurts. It just, it's like the woodies. Some really quick propagation tips. Make sure you have two nodes below the soil because that's where your roots are going to come from. And then sometimes I cut the leaves in half to reduce some of that transpiration because you know, they're not taking up water until they actually form roots. Um, so, and they like, you know, the humidity will help, you know, spritzing them a little bit will help too. So maybe in pots, is that what you guys were thinking? Yeah. Four inch pots or something. Well, start with a small pot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Okay. Awesome okay. question. Um, let's see a question here from Emily. Uh, I'm wanting to try composting to reduce food waste in my trash. My apartment has a small patio. What are my options and tricks for getting one started? My first suggestion would be vermicomposting. That's what I do uh, at home. I have a tub 
in my, it's actually in my kitchen island in a drawer that I can just pull, pull open and closed. And um, it has some air holes drilled in the side. It's just a plastic Rubbermaid tub. Uh, and I started with some newspaper, some food materials in there, a little bit of soil to start with, added some red wiggler worms to it. And now whenever I have a small amount of food waste, I'll put it in that worm uh, bin, which for me is a lot easier than taking it outside and making a pile somewhere and starting an actual compost bin. So vermicompost would be my suggestion. How about you guys? Yeah, I've been, I've been impressed with how quickly those worms can do their job. I mean, it's almost hard to keep up mm -hmm. when you get a good uh, composter going with worms. Yeah. I had mine on top of my kitchen table and you would think that, you know, it'd be kind of gross putting in kitchen scraps and having worms on your table, but you can't smell it. They work really well. Um, I, I think it's a really cool apartment option. I think so too. And really the only thing to manage is to make sure it doesn't get too wet in there. The only time I ever have had issues is if it's gotten too wet and then you might get a little bit of smell and some insects in there. But otherwise, as long as you're kind of maintaining the moisture in there, it's super easy to maintain. My composting is probably not the official composting method. I've drilled holes into trash cans and then I just layer my greens and browns. So I love it when I have straw around or leaves because you always have to, if you're gonna just put you know, that fresh, those fresh weeds or those fresh scraps, then you need the browns, the carbon of the browns to help the microorganisms break it all down. And um, I've had really great success of just, you know, just mixing the greens and the browns in a trash uh, can. Mm -hmm. One thing I had to do was I had to worry about the wetness too. And I had to make sure I had many holes drilled into the bottoms and the sides mm -hmm. of, of my compost. But all I know is that eggshells don't break down. <laughs> Have you guys noticed that in your composting? I usually don't put mine in there, but I could see how, yeah, they probably wouldn't. I put mine in, uh, but yeah, I find little chunks. I think I think by the time my compost is finished, they're mostly gone, but. Pretty small, or they're small enough that you don't notice, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've got just like big giant open bins outside that are super easy to just dump stuff into and shift around. And so, I mean, it's quite the process before, you know, my compost works its way all the way down to the last bend and it's finished, um, which we just unloaded a bunch here as we've been, you know, opening up the garden for the vegetable garden for the year. So this is the time of year I'm usually kind of finishing it up and putting it out. But um, yeah, nice. my experience with composting has been outdoors that, um, you know, honestly, I think a lot of folks have the easiest time with one of those just commercially made things you buy that you can turn and that you know so you may have room on your patio for one of those um, and you can buy those at just about any garden center or you know hardware store kind of place uh, you can make your own very effectively as well but um, I think for just smaller scale a lot of folks do better with that turning mechanism if you're not mm -hmm. going to use any worms but it allows you to mix it really yeah. well, where in my case I'm doing a lot of hand shoveling between the two bins you know, and, and I don't know that it's, I mean, it's definitely not a weekly thing. Maybe monthly I'm out there turning or doing something. So mine's kind of labor intensive, but it's just a bigger system. Cause I also have um, just a small amount of farm animals that produce a little bit of manure and bedding waste and other stuff that I'm mixing in. So it's a way for me to get rid of all my stuff, including kitchen scraps, but um, definitely a worthwhile thing to do though. Sure. It's the ultimate of recycling. Cool. Good question, Emily. Hopefully that gives you some tips on, on how to get started. Um, let's see, we've got a follow-up comment with some, uh, a list of mosquito repelling plants, but like Kelly said, you would need a lot of them, or you would need to be breaking the stems continually to get that out into the air. But also a follow-up question, are there plants to avoid planting for mosquitoes? Like any that they might favor for shelter or be attracted to more than another. Well, I know this is going to surprise everyone, but mosquitoes are pollinators. Mm -hmm. And it's only the female mosquito 
when she's trying to grow her eggs, does she need a blood meal of protein to um, get that? Um, you know, uh, I, I don't know if I can really answer the question. Yeah, they're gonna hang out in your plants. And, but I, I do know that uh, there was actually some research that came out um, uh, a couple of years ago from University of Illinois that talked about um, mowing versus not mowing and actually the not mowing had uh, fewer mosquito problems than the mowing um, because the water collected and the different debris um, actually promoted mosquito development. But um, Ryan, can you help? I, I don't know what else. Well, I don't know. I guess I was just thinking about it from a standpoint of, you know, where in my yard do I run into mosquitoes for one thing and what kind of plant structure maybe helps them a little bit. And I just would think to me, it's, it's almost like those dense evergreen, you know, wind blocking kind of things that make, you know, again, they don't, it doesn't want the wind to blow through and kind of disperse mosquitoes or, you know, inhibit them from flying as well and things. So maybe that's what you want to think about is, is not having a big, large evergreen somewhere. So I have a Norway spruce by the back corner of our yard that I've put a little campfire pit in by it. So we hang out by there and I've, I swear that Norway spruce kind of harbors some mosquitoes, or maybe it's just the fact that that's kind of the woods edge too, where that tree is. But, you know, the fact of the matter is in my open yard where it's mowed grass and there's more wind blowing and more open space, I have less mosquito problem than closer to tall vegetation that's thicker. And so I'm just trying to think about, you know, maybe if you want to think about that, that structure of the plant, maybe you want something more open and not as thick you know, to just not give them as much wind block, essentially, I think is what it kind of is. Uh, but I don't know. I don't, I don't know the answer to it totally, but that's just kind of some of the thoughts that go through my head. Yeah. Or maybe a less crowded landscape. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Keep better air. Which is kind of contradictory to what we want. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, you know, we want things that are good for all insects and just I mean, in my case, like I, I'm helping out mosquitoes right along with others probably by providing good habitat in my backyard. But I just view it as, um, you know, the, the, the main thing that I do with mosquitoes is try and schedule my work and time in the garden around the time that they're the most active. So, you know, obviously after dark, at dusk and dawn, those are going to be the times they're the most active. So it kind of stinks, but that leaves like high noon, the hottest part mm -hmm. of the day mm -hmm. is, you know, the time to avoid mosquitoes. So I've just learned that over the years from having to garden after my kids go to bed or, you know, at, at night in a headlamp. And then I've got every mosquito in the county right in my face at my headlamp and getting chewed, ate alive. So yeah. time it, but it also depends on the activity you're doing. So if I am, you know, carefully weeding and not moving much, that's going to be a terrible thing with a headlamp at night to do. But if I'm hauling loads of wood chips and mulch and I'm moving around or, you know, that's something that maybe you can do at night. So that's just how I deal with it as, as best I can is just try and, you know, look at the time I'm working and the activity I'm doing and don't plan something where you're just bent over in one spot meticulously working for when the mosquitoes are out. And haven't you noticed that mosquito attacks different people differently? Uh -huh. Yes. Uh, yeah. I was on a tree walk with Candace in Rockford, mm -hmm either last spring or the spring before, I can't really remember. And there were so many mosquitoes out and we were just, uh, you know, um, I was getting eaten alive and some people were complaining. Some people weren't complaining. Some people had mosquitoes hanging out on their skin and they weren't biting them. But that didn't, wasn't true for me. I think I actually had the worst reaction in the whole group and had to, you know, as soon as I went back, had to alcohol and put stuff on it. But um, unfortunately, well, that was one of those. That was last spring after we had all that rain. Yeah. yeah. That, that, those, that, that was, there were so many mosquitoes. It was unreal. Was and, well, the, and we were walking through a wooded area of an arboretum. So there was no air movement. So it was, yeah, a lot. <laughs> well, definitely true okay, that we're attracted to, 
different folks. You know, just between my wife and myself, I'm the first one to always be getting bit. Well, she they're not even bothering her. She they're not they're not as attracted to her. So I don't know. Um, it maybe has to do with our own personal sense or whatever it is. But there's definitely a, you know a difference in people and how how attractive you are to mosquitoes. Oh yeah, for sure. Okay, we've got a couple questions on deck, but we're about halfway through. So I wanna go ahead and go back to some of our kids gardening topics before we go back to questions. So keep adding those uh, questions in the comment box. We'll get to those today. But Ryan, do you wanna kind of talk about some of your kids gardening sure. stuff? Yeah, sure. I just, I have some pictures too, a little bit of show and tell. I'll try and get my screen pulled up to share here. Um, but, uh, you know, one of the things I think is a real good point about all this is just keeping things simple. Um, you know, with my kids, I, so, so we did a little bit of a seed starting experiment that we set up in the last couple of days. So I'll kind of go through that. And, you know, for Kel both Kelly's scavenger hunt that she covered earlier and my seed experiment, we do have a handout that would cover that. And if you just um, add that to the comments or, or request that from us, we can send those to you individually. We don't have a way to share a a link of those live right now. So, but happy to share those. And it has a little more detail um, than what I'll give here on our little experiment. But um, yeah, I've just found that my, you know, my kids, a lot of times, if it's out in the garden um, in particular, they may not be interested in weeding or planting for very long, but man, just like a shovel to dig somewhere is a great thing for them to have just a spot where they can just mess around. So you know, my, my sons are six and nine. So, you know, by the point the six-year-old is tuning out on trying to plant okra seeds, he can be over there with a rake and a shovel, just messing around and doing things. So, you know, I, I just always try and kind of set my expectations low and don't expect these guys to be out there for three hours, you know, being productive and helping me. Like, like Kelly mentioned earlier, it probably slows you down a little bit to have them with you, but um, so don't have high expectations of getting things done, but go slow, make it fun for them. And, you know, any, anything we go out there to do, it's not something we have to get done today before it rains. You know, we, we, I pick relaxed times to kind of get them involved. And, and you know, some days it's five minutes is all I can keep their attention. But at least they walk out of there knowing what an okra seed feels like and, you know, looks like. Um, so, and just like with any kids, there's certain activities that they're more in, into. You know, something with little tiny dinky seeds is not the best. And you'll see in this little experiment we did, we use radish seeds. So those are kind of small uh, where, man, like putting potatoes out. I think you had a picture of that, Kelly. That's a great one. Kids can hold on to seed potatoes. They can pick them up. They can put them in the trench. They can see exactly just about how to space them out. So I did have my youngest helping me with that this year. And, uh, you know, one little tip, one thing that he just loved that we did is, you know, I was trying to get him to space those potato chunks every six or eight inches or whatever our spacing was is we went and found a stick and just snapped it into that length. So then he could lay a <laughs> stick out with each potato thing. And boy, he was, you know, that really interested him. And, you know, he was getting his hands dirty and getting into the dirt. But um, but anyway, we did a little more of a formalized experiment and just to kind of look at uh, seed germination and experiment with that. So uh, again, we used radish seeds. You can kind of see our materials here. So it does take a little bit of stuff. Um, I have these nice little four inch pots. Uh, but you wouldn't have to use that. You could use like old yogurt containers with holes poked in the bottom. You could use any type of plastic you would normally recycle in a little container as a pot, and it just needs drain holes in the bottom would be the biggest thing. But uh, what we did was planted three different pots of radishes, and then we're going to expose them to three different tests of germination. So one of those we're going to put in our windowsill, uh, one we're going to put in the fridge, you know, and one we're going to put in just a dark closet. So there we have a variation in the light they're exposed to the and the temperature that they're exposed to. So what I'm hoping we'll see out of this is that, you know, light is not that big of a deal in the case of germination. We'll probably get some germination out of seeds, regardless of whether they have full sun on them or not. But in the refrigerator, we're probably not because the temperature is low enough. Those seeds won't be able to germinate. So it, it teaches them some of these differences. So, um, here you see the, the boys out on a picnic table outside. That's a, it's a great outside activity because they love filling the pots with the soil. So let them make a mess on a picnic table. Don't, don't try and do this in your living room. <laughs> you know, or, or you're going to have a mess. And maybe, maybe you're fine uh, cleaning up a mess. And that, that's okay. But uh, one way that's really helped these guys is I, I have that little bucket that I've poured the potting soil in. So that allows those guys to get in there and scoop with their hands or with the... Um, 
with the pots or, or what, however they want to get the soil in. So here you can see these guys kind of scooping out their soil and starting to fill the pots. And then uh, here's the radish seeds. They're tiny. So they're, they're just big enough. These guys can grab them. Not as small as like a kale seed or something that's really tiny. But uh, you see we have a sheet of paper there with rocks on it. So that's what we did to be able to pour some seeds out and have them grab them. Um, it just makes it a little easier so they can kind of grab those seeds off the paper and put them in the pots. Um, you know, to, to actually make a planting hole, I found one of the easiest things to do is use a pencil like you see here where they've, they're actually using the eraser, which if you look at the back of the seed packet or the radishes or any type of seed that you'd use, um, it has a planting depth. So for these radishes, it was a quarter inch and that pink of the pencil eraser is just about a quarter inch. So those guys can really understand. Notice we're not using the pointy tip because if we've done that before and then they make this big giant deep crater that those seeds fall way down into. With the eraser, you kind of plunk down a little hole and it, seeds can fall into those. And so then these guys, here they are kind of dropping the seeds in. And here's kind of our finished product where we actually did so, so we're going to do an experiment with this where we put these pots in different places. You can see um, the last step of it is kind of watering those. So we have them in a tray of water and that allows, you know, that water to kind of wick up through the pot over the course of an hour or so. It'll, it'll get all that soil moist. At, or you could pour it on top. Uh, the problem with pouring water into the top of that really light fluffy potting soil is it can float around and mix around a little bit and may disturb your seeds. So uh, we found it a little easier just to sit, let them sit in that pan and, and tray. But you know, you can see a little pot of sprouted radish seeds that we planted maybe two weeks ago. And quite honestly, that is a fun enough activity for my kids. We didn't have to necessarily add in all these, this experimentation. They really love just planting just some radishes and just letting them sit on the windowsill. Um, you know, we chose radish seeds just because they germinate quickly and grow fast. And you can fit about three radish plants in a little pot like that. So um, anyway, that's just a, a fun little experiment for starting seeds and just hopefully some tips to, to ease the introduction to your kids and how they might uh, actually do that um, if, if you choose to try and do that with them. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. Uh, so anyway, that's kind of the gist of it. Just keep it simple. Maybe it's just throwing some seeds in a pot and watching them sprout. Maybe that's good enough. Or, you know, for my nine-year-old, I think he was pretty interested in seeing, you know, thinking through, uh, how these seeds are going to germinate. We, are, we actually did form a hypothesis of what we think will happen, happen with each pot. So we'll see if our hypotheses hold up. Um, nice. I just recommend that we're going to do it for maybe two weeks here and see what germinates. And then, you know, the radishes you see and saw in that picture that had actually grown, we're, we're going to keep watering and just nurse along. But really the seed germination experiments meant you just kind of see if they sprout and then you're kind of, you're done. You don't have to uh, keep taking care of the plants if you don't want to. So so science, math, that sounds like a perfect homeschool lesson. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was it was a fun one. We, we did it yesterday as part of our school activities. That's awesome. Very cool. Okay, well, before we get back to questions, I'll go ahead and show uh, what I've got today too. Um, I didn't have any kids to take cute pictures with, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but I'm going to talk about... Um, kitchen scrap gardening because I think we've all noticed with this quarantine that a lot of people who uh, aren't gardening are getting interested in gardening or wanting to try things. I have a, a friend in particular who um, has never gardened before and, and now is obsessed with gardening and <laughs> growing anything she can inside and one of those things she's doing is kind of these kitchen scrap gardening ideas. So we have a whole blog post about it on our website so you can always go and kind of read a little bit more about it but Basically, the idea is that you're taking kitchen scraps from the vegetables that you already have in your, your kitchen and then growing those on to see if you can grow more of it and kind of keep it keep it growing. So I tried a couple of things in my kitchen this past week. Um, I think one that you see a lot, of course, are, are avocados. A lot of us have probably seen this on Pinterest or on Facebook where you can take the seed out of that avocado and you can have it kind of resting in a cup of water and wait for it to sprout. So these have only been in here about a week, so they're not doing anything yet. But what should happen is that the sheets should sprout and you should have an avocado plant starting to, to go. You do wanna change the water out frequently so that it doesn't get gross. Um, I also did some lettuce. So I 
have a romaine lettuce start here that I just cut the top off of to actually eat the romaine lettuce. And you can see it is starting to sprout some more romaine lettuce coming out of there. And same thing here, it's just been kind of nestling in a uh, cup of water in the, close to a window. So that one's going pretty good. And then also had some green onions too. So these were super easy. I, the tops had been cut off that I've used and they already actually have little roots on them already most of the time from the grocery store. So you can just place those in a cup of water and you can see all the new green growth is all new growth that's come from those that I can now cut and use again. So definitely fun for kids to just have, save those scraps and see what you can continue to grow uh, in the kitchen. Have you guys tried any of these, any other crops you've done? Uh, you know, we tried a sweet potato just cause it was already sprouting. And I think we mm -hmm. just neglected it horribly at the start <laughs> uh, that it, it's kind of, it's not, <laughs> We stressed it a little too much by not watering it well, but um, yeah, we've got a few onions in the window, so sure. just make fun of it. Um, I, I really like the lettuce one. I never thought of that. I think that would sprout really well and show some cool. Mm -hmm. so. And you can do celery and bok choy. I mean, as long yeah. as it has that stem base, it's going to shoot up new leaves. Yep, for sure. I've even done it with the, I've grown a pineapple before too, where you, mm -hmm. you cut off the top mm -hmm. of the pineapple and you plant that and then you can actually have that pineapple plant keep growing, which is kind of cool. So just fun stuff to experiment with. And we've, I think we've linked that blog post in the comments there. So you can definitely go read more about that. Yeah. Just plain old potatoes are kind of fun just because mm -hmm. the, the sprouts that come off them are so crazy looking yeah. I don't know <laughs> on that sprouted a potato, but they're almost alien looking things as they start to come out of the potato. So my kids have kind of liked watching those and same thing, just over a cup of water, like Candace was showing, but that's. Mm -hmm. Well, and sometimes you do that by accident, you leave them in the fridge for too long or mm -hmm. the pantry and they sprout on their own. Cool. Okay. So some good tips for kids gardening that hopefully gives you guys some inspiration for things to try, but I know we've got more questions coming in. So let's go back here and address some of those. So keep them coming into the comments. We've got about 15 minutes or so left. Um, let's see. Question from Amy. Um, she has a Mexican purple passion plant that has grown like crazy inside over the winter. Should I divide it or prune it to control it? So purple Mexican purple passion plant, which is a tropical um, tropical plant. Um, yeah, is Amy, I would say if you're wanting to make it smaller, um, you can certainly cut it back. I'm not, I can't picture Mexican purple passion if it's a trailing. Kelly, do, can you? I feel like it's like Zabrinus. That's what I'm thinking. It's a trailing, very multi-stemmed um, so plant. Could, so in that case, you could certainly divide it. A, or or pot it up or cut it back to not even an inch of its mm -hmm. life and it'll pu push out new sprouts. Um, you know, mm -hmm. in the greenhouse, you know, I used to have to manage a tropical plant selection. So I'd go take three cuttings, throw the old plant away but definitely division, pot it up, cut it back. It, it, I think people are surprised when they watch me cut things back because like for instance, Ming fern or asparagus fern, I can cut it, it will have at, to, the, to like a fourth of an inch. It'll have nothing on it and it'll come back with a vengeance. Sometimes things just need to be cut back. Mm -hmm. So, it kind of re reinvigorates the growth a little bit, yeah. Uh, if you cut it back, take some cuttings. Start a new plant. Have fun. Put it in a glass of water. Put it in soil. Um, yeah. It's not hard to uh, take cuttings of that plant. And then share it, share it with friends. Leave them on people's porches. Here's a, a plant surprise. <laughs> I know. I think a lot of people, I, I mean, I think... You know, when we think about what we're dealing with right now in the middle of a crisis, you know, it'd be nice to have, you know, uh, you know, a gift of a new plant. Uh, you know, we're here. We're ready to take care of it. Um, I personally love taking care of plants and um, the uh, the joy of taking care of them too. But 
I, I know we're going to another question, but let me say one more thing. Um, you know, if you start planting this year, and this is the first time you've ever gardened, and you kill a plant, big deal. How many right. plants do you think the three of us have killed? Lots. We have killed more than you'll ever kill in your life, um, just because of the, our, the industry we work in. So, um, you know, I, I love it when people are like, I, I can't grow plants, or I can't grow this plant. Well, you know, maybe it was the soil, maybe it was the weather, maybe it was you know, the rain, maybe it was, you know, not the right plant. Maybe it was not a healthy plant. You know, there's so many variables that go into gardening that this thing that you're trying to teach the kids is to experiment and have fun. You do that yourself. Experiment, have fun. You know, you know, don't beat yourself up if a plant doesn't produce the way you want it to. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's great advice. And I, I'll even add that I think I've learned the most from things I've killed. <laughs> yeah, for <laughs> sure. Healthy things, you know, so. Mm -hmm. That was part that's... of our master's degree, right? <laughs> one of it, yeah. <laughs> you have to kill a thousand plants before you can get one. <laughs> <laughs> it's a badge of honor. <laughs> okay, uh, let's see here. We've got a follow-up question about the kitchen scrap. Uh, Robin asks, will the celery ever get to full height? I've never done celery mm -hmm. long enough to find out. Kelly, have you ever? It really it is just the leaves. You're gonna yeah. get a lot of the leafy growth. You'd have to grow up for a really long time to get, you know, real mm -hmm. substantial stalks. I think uh, the reason they use the celery is because it has such a great base and you can use those leaves to add to soups or salads or, you know, it's not like you're gonna, you know, have a, I mean, you'd have to grow up for a while to yeah. get that crisp, celery with the peanut butter so yep yep agreed agreed okay awesome um let's see here's an insect question for you kelly what would you recommend for spotting or spotted they ask caused by thrips thrips control well um Working in a greenhouse, thrips was my nemesis. So it was very hard to control thrips because they like to be in little tight spots and they leave damage on your plants and they, you know, eat the uh, flowers and the pollen. Um, but not really seen them be such a huge problem out in the landscape. Because usually at that point, um, beneficial insects come in and sort of take control. It's kind of like with aphids. You ever have a really bad, you know, sometimes if you have like millions of aphids, the beneficial insects can't keep up, but um, not, not really, I don't really have ha or have seen lots of problems with thrips in the landscape. It's usually a greenhouse um, plant and um, you know, if that's so, I'd put it outside as soon as it's above 55 degrees, if it's a tropical or a tender a annual. Um, I, I know uh, you could do a Bavaria bassiana, but uh, that'd be a, something you'd have to order from a, a landscape center or a greenhouse. Um, it's a biological chemical that uh, doesn't kill other beneficial insects that might help. But when you use a biological chemical, you're not going to get, you know, 100% control. You're really going to get 50% control. So, um, you know, for instance, in the greenhouse, if I were to control thrips, I might use my Bavaria bassiana ahead of time. And then uh, a few days later, I might release some beneficial predator mites to try to clean up the population a little bit. But I'm, ne I'm never going to get full control in a greenhouse. But... Candace, do you ever have problems with thrips in the landscape? Am I, am, I feel like it's I not a landscape pest. I don't. I've seen some of my cut flower grower friends post before where they've had some thrips problems like in the fields, but typically it's when they have a mass planting of a particular type of flower. I've on a home gardener scale, I've never, I never have. So, yeah. So you could, and I bet if Kelly, if you, this person could certainly email you probably if they if they did have a little bit more specific information they needed some help. Oh, with. absolutely. When it comes to greenhouse management of pests, it's all I did. <laughs> Kelly's, 
Kelly's the person. <laughs> okay, excellent questions. I'm going to hop back over to our YouTube stream here because we've got some over here. Um, Allie asks, um, looking for planting suggestions for a shady area that floods and holds water. She said it's a public area, so trying to avoid toxic plants. So planting suggestions, shady area that floods and holds water. What would you do? Ryan, you could tell them about that rain gardening. Um, what's the name of it? Mm -hmm. that uh, Donna runs? Yeah, is it rainscaping? Mm -hmm. I think of the name of that. So um, yeah, what mm -hmm. is that extension? Eliana Brown has uh, brought a, a program over from Purdue. So she's got um, access to it. It was created in Purdue, but it's, it's yeah, it deals with this exact question of rainscaping, how to build rain gardens, what plants suit that. Um, and so it's really just kind of starting in Illinois. We haven't got that up and going, but in the coming year, I think we're going to have a lot of programming around that, whether it's um, at some point, if we can ever meet in person, in-person things or online webinars, uh, be watching the extension sites for that. I'm not sure if we have things on the calendar yet or not, but I know it's um, some new programming we're bringing, but um, while we're talking about Eliana, though, she and um, some colleagues have also created some nice little flyers on native plants. And so I know they just recently did some mm -hmm. on species, and I know there's one of those that is specific to, uh, you know, wet woodlands. Or And so that's what I'm, I'm trying to pull it open on a separate screen here. Uh, we probably could share this out as, as anybody wants it. I know um, all of these brochures we did post on our Pollinator Pockets webpage, so that's that web page is available through, you have to actually go to the Champaign County Extension web page, which, you know, Champaign, Ford, Iroquois, and Vermilion counties, but um, then you can find pollinator pockets in there. And at the very, very bottom of all the pollinator pockets page, we have some designs listed and things. And this is a kind of like a PDF brochure, a series of about six of them that are just beautifully put together. But um, so may, actually maybe I'll screen share real quick here. And pull now, all you have to do is Google pollinator pockets. And it comes up? Yeah. Um, pop up, yeah. So you guys should be seeing this just a really great um, handout that they've put together. So mm -hmm. um, what I like about it is the design on the inside here where they kind of show in the upper left, you know, kind of how you might arrange those plants. And then there's this table that shows you, you know, the height, uh, the light requirements, and kind of shows you pictorially there when things flower and when things will look pretty. And if you look at their um, prairie uh, handout similar to this, it's really apparent what flowers when because you can see you can see the flowering in that those photographs. But uh, nice display, but you know, some, some of my favorites out of here and, and some of the easiest and best to do, uh, wild geranium's an awesome one for a shady area um, and can grow into a patch that's competitive with other stuff. You know, right up at the top there, wild geranium and wild ginger are two that I have quite a bit of around my property. Mm -hmm. You know, the ferns, I'm starting to just now add to some of my landscaping, but I do really like those. And there's more ferns beyond what's listed here that are kind of commercially available. Um, I've had to get some of the more exotic ones. You know, I, I love to always uh, give our local garden centers my business, but to get some of the more difficult to get ones, I actually ordered some ferns this spring. Um, over the internet, um, which I'm still I'm still shocked at how we can ship plants around, and that that's just a thing now. And and they they do fine. You know, I was reluctant to do that at the start, but just out of what what are some of those smaller shrubs that you could add to this type of setting or smaller plants? Uh, that's what I like. I think winterberry, so deciduous holly, is an excellent recommendation. That's the last listed here. If you're looking for something woody. Um, if it's got just a little bit tiny more sun, uh, button bush is a wonderful one that can't handle shade real great. But um, if you've got some park sun type settings, that's a good one. Um, also previously mentioned was spice bush. That's one that can handle pretty wet spots. Uh, probably not standing water, but a wetter location. So uh, there's some shrubs for you. But um, hopefully folks are able to find these brochures. They're just wonderful and it covers everything from uh, you know, a full sun rain garden type setting to here we have a woodland setting. Uh, they also cover just different, you know, kind of groupings of native plants. So it's all, it's all native stuff is what I like as the focus here. Mm -hmm. So I'll go ahead. Yeah, and I love those. I love those handouts they've created. Those are super, super handy. I love that she's using the sedge 
because you know I've been mm -hmm. that that Roy Diblick book that I was into a while ago. He really really dug the sedges because they were super adaptable plants to many. Yeah. Soil, um, yeah, they're tough. Yeah, they're, they're tough. I just think about where I've seen them in nature. You know, I used to do wetland delineation for a living for a couple of years and man, sedges, they can handle some tough environmental conditions, tough mm -hmm. things um, where they work wonderfully. I'm sure this is what uh, Diblick talks about is just as a ground cover to mm -hmm. fill in that those areas. So it's something I haven't added to my current landscaping yet, but I have the same kind of issue of a wet spot or what corner of our yard that's kind of shady. And so um, just recently from a plant sale, I ordered a couple different sedges and see how they go. But I, I would view them as pretty, I mean, pretty easy to probably establish and keep going mm -hmm. uh, just based okay. on function in nature. You almost wouldn't have to plant them, just put them on the ground. Right. <laughs> Or just don't mow where, wherever that is. That's <laughs> right. Wet. Yeah. Okay, we've got a couple minutes left, and it looks like I think maybe one more question to go. So this should be just about right. Uh, question here: uh, What do you recommend to avoid ticks without using strong pesticides? I'm sure ticks is going to be a common question uh, here pretty soon. So any tips well, for? I can speak from experience of a lot of ticks <laughs> in the past. Um, for a number of years, I was a, a area forester in Southern Illinois. So looking at forests all across Southern Illinois to help people manage the plants in there. And um, just all that time in the field between that and grad school and, you know, I camp and, and do a lot of things outdoors. Um, you know, quite possibly the best recommendation I could give anybody. And, and I'm not a big chemical using person. I went to both extremes and you know when I was doing my thesis and doing field work a lot I used a, a lot of deep you know deep woods off and, you know the heavy deep laden stuff to keep ticks off of me which can work but um, as I've gotten older I've started to you know not want to use as many chemicals and so man I, honestly the best thing that I can recommend is just to avoid those really ticky places and so in my field work as a forester, I could avoid a lot of spots that I, from experience, knew would walk through and get ticks just all over me. So that's those really grassy, thick, brushy places are, are where you're going to see ticks. So, you know, that's easy for me to say as somebody that works in the woods where I can just, you know, shoot around that grassy edge and get into the shaded woodland, you know, and get into a spot that doesn't have some of that stuff as, as thick. But um, I think it's, I think it's, it's also important to get like your pants tucked into your socks so they don't, they can't just crawl right up your leg. They're, they'll be on the outside of your clothes for a while. So those are the best things that I've used. I really haven't had great luck with anything of a natural kind of ingredient uh, as a repellent. I, I just don't know that it's worked very well on ticks in particular. Um, so that's how I do it. I just try and be, be smart in where I'm walking through. Um, and I try to not have just an open pant leg down there that a tick can just crawl right up into, where at least if they're on the outside of my clothes, I've got a chance to see them and pull them off before they, they get to my skin. So, And inspect yourself. Uh, it, it takes a little bit for them to settle. They're going to be crawling around for a little bit, so they may not settle by the time you get home, take your shower and look around a little bit. And I personally feel like um, this is another one of Kelly's philosophies. If it is a concern for human health, then this is when chemicals really should be used. For instance, do I want you out there pulling poison ivy or would I rather you spray it with an herbicide? I'd rather you spray it with an herbicide. I don't want you to have poison ivy. Do I want you to um, get bit by um, uh, ticks? No, because they potentially carry diseases that could really threaten your health. So this would be the time when you would pull out the DEET and use it. Um, I just feel like, you know, we are, I, I agree, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm probably just as much anti-chemical as Ryan is, and I don't want us to just use chemicals all willy-nilly, but we did develop these, and there is a time to use them, and when it comes to your own health, this is the time to use them. Yeah, I think that's really great advice. I mean, it, I'm the same way of, 
you know, try not to use chemicals unless I have to, but man, like invasive species, you know, that's one point where I've drawn the line. I will use a chemical on an invasive species. Um, I think it's a really good point, Kelly. This is probably the time and place that, um, you know, it's good use of a chemical and they're, you know, like DEET is very effective at repelling them. And it's also comes down to those points they're going to get on you. So when I do use DEET or any type of repellent, I focus on my lower pant legs, mm -hmm. you know, not spraying it around my head, um, you know, mm -hmm. so pants man that's one of the most important places tuck in your shirt spray the lower part of your shirt so um yeah so i think that's great advice um probably the time and place for chemical use is repelling ticks because there's a lot of things you can get from ticks and it's a very serious health concern so great advice don't spray glyphosate on your on your dandelions but spray them on the poison ivy. <laughs> there, you go. there you go. Good advice, everybody. Well, we've reached that one hour mark. So I want to say thank you, everybody, for hopping on to watch today and submitting the questions today. And hopefully you got a couple tips for different kids activities you can try out to get them engaged in gardening. So we appreciate you coming on. We'll be back on uh, to do this again with a different topic. And